Uh, and welcome all of you to this uh, conversation we're having tonight with Michael Black. Um, uh, just by way of very quick introduction, my name is Aaron Miller. I'm one of the rabbis here at Washington Hebrew. Uh, and, uh, and it's just such a joy to be joined by Michael Black. So Michael, uh, has uh, a, just a terrific uh, a career in bio, in TV, in movies. He's started his career as a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Uh, you don't find that in his bio, but it certainly is in his book. He uh, went on to, uh, to join a sketch comedy group that was featured in a terrific TV show on MTV. I remember that from my MTV watching days, and that was, that was awesome. Um, I, I loved him in Wet Hot American Summer in The Baxter. He was in This Is... 40. He's been on Stephen Colbert. Uh, he's been on Tim and Eric. I mean, you name it. This, this guy This guy is a fixture in the comedy world. Uh, he's also an author, which is what brings us together tonight. Um, he's written kids books uh, titled I'm Bored, I'm Sad, uh, and I'm Worried. Also a child's first book of Trump. Is that actually a kid's book? Well, it was written as a parody of a children's book, but... <laughs> parents, kids actually seem to really like it because they don't understand it's a real person. They, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a character called a Trump. And so you can read it to kids and have them just think it's a kind of a scary monster. Not to get overly political, but that is absolutely how my children understand that situation as well. Um, except they 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 struggle with the R, so it's, it's Twump, which is I think the cutest thing in the world. Um, uh, Michael has uh, written adult uh, books for adults as well, memoirs like uh, "You're Not Doing It Right" and "Navel Gazing." Uh, if you listen to podcasts, he's been on Mike and Tom Eat Snacks topics, how to be amazing and obscure. Uh, he has written a fantastic book that we're here to talk about, uh, A Better Man, which is a, a subtitled, A Mostly Serious Letter to His Son. Uh, it is a letter that he wrote to his son before uh, before his boy went off to college. Um, and uh, and so, Michael, I'm thrilled that you are here with us. I, I'm sure you would say, you know, at the top of your bio, if, if, if you could add this to your bio, would be uh, husband and father of two which I know having read uh, A Better Man uh, mean the world to you. So thank you for joining. Thank you for being here. And oh, thank you, uh, 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 thank you uh, everybody for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so um, uh, I was thinking about the best way to start with this book. And I think maybe the best way to do this and the best way to begin our conversation is to talk about a comedy sketch that runs through the book and, uh, and I took Spanish in high school, but I'm gonna butcher the accent. Um, it's a Saturday Night Live skit that I'd love for you to tell us about. Uh, Quien es más macho, right? So can you tell us about this skit? Sure. I talk about this sketch. Uh, it becomes a kind of running theme in the book. It's from 1979. It stars Bill Murray as a, a game show host of a Venezuelan game show called Quien es más macho. And the whole sketch is in Spanish. And the, the idea of the sketch is uh, there's the host and two contestants and the host just puts uh, two pictures of random male celebrities on and the contestants have to guess who is more macho, which of the two. Um, and what's funny about it is that, this, the, the, is that there is a correct answer. <laughs> Like you watch it and you're like, wait a minute, I think Ricardo Montalban is a little bit more macho than Lorenzo Lamas. And what's, what's true about it is that all of us as people can kind of quantify masculinity, although so often we don't understand why. Like we don't know why we can say Rabbi Miller's more macho than Michael Black, and yet we seem to know that it's correct. And in fact, that is the correct answer if you put the both of us up on the screen. <laughs> um, I, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a terrific sketch. I, I should also say I'm laughing just in my own mind because um, uh, for a brief time in COVID, although far too long, if you ask my wife, I had a beard. And um, and as I was reading your book, I was thinking about, and I want to hear more about uh, about your term, which I love, this infinite access, uh, infinite access of manhood, right? That um, that there are there are always going to be things and people more manly than you or what you have or, or are doing. Sure. Um, Here's the thing about so I I coined this term, the infinite access right. of manliness, and you can put anything on this 
sort of infinite line and rank it according to which is <laughs> more macho than the other thing. So the reason, like I can just pick a couple things why you would win in this particular version of Kienes Mas Macho is, first of all, a little bit of chest hair. Like we're both, we both have the V on, right? <laughs> You've got a little bit of Chester. I've got none. It's Second, the Ashkenazi jeans. I, well, I'm Ashkenazi too. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Bereft of chest hair over here. Also, the plaid shirt, far more masculine than the teal cashmere sweater. Can I just say, and my, my wife's not here, although she would absolutely validate this. When I was getting ready for the call, and what, what I also what I was hoping you'd notice is the is the neat bourbon. Um, uh, this is as manly as it gets, right? This is me dressing up for this particular conversation. And I was hoping that you would bring up the plaid shirt, the chest hair, and the, well, it's now me. empty, now the bourbon glass, right? right. I've got, I, I just have water here. I mean, you know, not macho at all. Water is one of the least macho drinks you can have. What is the least macho drink you can have? Um, anything, uh, uh, well, not even that. I mean, because anything with booze, maybe strawberry quick, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> Strawberry quick, it, which, which is great because you have to walk the line of like, what is a child's drink? So my, my first thought was like Yoohoo, but Yoohoo is clearly for children, right? But what is something that theoretically- Oh like, no, Strawberry quick, I mean, it's all for children, but it, I mean, those, you know, flavored milks are for kids. But, I, but, the, the but just- I had a few people write to me milk. Yes. Yeah, which goes to show, and they're all men who wrote to me, um, that there is something about being a man where we have internalized some way these unspoken rules about what is manly and what isn't. We right. And, and like I said, it's infinite. Like, I, you know, I'm just picking random things here. And yet I feel like everybody on this call would agree with them. You know what I mean? Like, we're all speaking from the same vocabulary. Yeah. Um, but we often don't understand that vocabulary. It's like we're all fluent in a language that we don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that you talk about, um, which it, it, honestly, it brought me back to middle school, is, um, is how we rank each other in conscious and unconscious ways. And, and maybe it starts for us in middle school, right? Where you could, you could um, look around your, your high school class or your middle school class without any empirical evidence and say, you know, he is, he is cooler, more popular, whatever word you want to use, than him, than him, than him, than him. And then it goes him. And then way down on the list is him. And no one's written out these rules, right? No one's given us these guidelines for, for what metrics to use, but you know it in your, in your, in your bones. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you pointed out, which I had honestly never thought of before, is when it comes to things that define us as men in America today, at least, um, and it's different for other countries, but in America today, um, uh, we've internalized, yeah, this language that we didn't even know we were speaking. I think every culture probably has it. And I think it, it, it must vary from culture to culture. Um, I mean, I know it does. I mean, you think about like uh, in, in the Middle East, the way men will hold hands, you know, regularly and, you know, you just would never do that. And kiss each other on the cheek. Sure. I mean, we see that all the time. Um, so, the, you know, this book is really geared towards, and not geared towards, it, it's written to my son. And I'm very careful to say, like, I'm writing this to you, like, uh, you know, a white, fairly privileged kid in Connecticut, you know, you're Jewish and, you know, it's, it's, it's directed at him, but I think I know, you know, I was writing obviously with a larger audience in mind and that so much of what is specific to him is applicable to a lot of other people. But like, you know, I couldn't, you know, I, 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 I would be hesitant to say like everything that is true about his life as a, you know, white privileged dude is going to be true for, you know, uh, an African American kid in yeah. this culture or a Hispanic kid in this culture. So yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm careful to say, like, I'm not speaking for everybody here. I, 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 I couldn't, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to presume. It, you know, you bring up an interesting point and you brought this up in the book too, in, in ways that expanded my horizons in a lot of ways. You know, one of the things about the book, I'll say this, and then I want to ask you a question about race. Um, uh, this is not just a book about manhood, it's also a book about privilege. Um, and, um, and one of the things that you write about 
privilege is how, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but it's this, um, it's this material under your feet that you don't even realize is there until you're walking on it. Um, again, I'm, I'm misquoting and I'm sorry, but um, you're, you're saying it better than I wrote it. You wrote it beautifully. Um, and so I want to, I want to take a moment and, um, and talk about privilege um, because you talk about manhood. You also talk about whiteness. Um, and I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about how those two uh, come together in ways that, um, uh, well, honestly, when you look at the beginning of the book, you talk about you talk about um, about shooters and you talk about the violence that comes from men. And and I wonder about the intersection between whiteness and uh, and, and masculinity. When I set out to write this, like I really did not want to inject race into the conversation, both because I felt like it was going to open up a whole Pandora's box and because I didn't feel like I was qualified to write it in any way. And, and, and by the way, I didn't feel like I was qualified to write the book that I wrote. Like I'm, I'm not a gender theorist or historian or a sociologist or anything. Like I'm a comedian, you know? And, but I wrote, but I, but I took this job seriously and I, and I wrote it as seriously as I, as I could with those caveats. But what I quickly realized is that it's impossible to talk about masculinity in this culture anyway, without also talking about race. Um, because foundationally, we are built on white male privilege, on, on the privileges of being white and male initially and a landowner, but, you know, even when that went away, the, the, this, I, this emergent idea of whiteness still remained and uh, uh, defined so much of how we thought of ourselves in this culture, whether, you know, whether you fit within that definition of whiteness or not. And it's interesting being Jewish um, because like the Irish, like the Italians, you know, our acceptance as white uh, has often felt conditional, yeah. you know? And I really experienced this a lot during the previous um, presidential campaign because I'm active on social media. And one of the big tropes that kept coming around again and again and again, when I was being attacked um, as anybody in social media gets attacked, was these anti-Semitic ideas of, um, if I said anything about race, they would say, well, you're not white anyway, you're Jewish. And they, yeah. wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily say it that kindly. Yeah. Um, but it really struck me. And I think, I suspect most Jews, at least my generation and older, maybe, and maybe to this day, um, have always felt conditionally accepted, whether it's as real citizens or real, you know, really white or whatever it is. And, but unlike, um, let's say African-Americans, we can look at the culture um, from observer's eyes without from a kind of slightly outsider's eyes um, and be very intimate in the culture yeah. without people necessarily knowing, for example, we're Jewish. Yeah. Um, and I think it gives, I think it gives, it gave, it has given me a more intimate perspective on the idea of race than maybe I would have had if I were Protestant or something. Yeah. You know, it's it, interesting. And, and you nail it on the head. I mean, this is what in, in so many ways from both sides of the political spectrum it is being described to me with a lot of people who are turning to rabbis now because you have, you have people, you have Jews specifically who are, pick your spectrum, right? Very involved in Republican politics um, who, who feel like there is a section of the party that, and we, we saw this outright uh, m recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, who is not just rejecting the Jewish story, but is hostile to Jewish existence. And on um, the political left, because I don't want to get in trouble here, right? Because this, we, we, we play on, on both sides. Um, on the political left is, is this idea that we are, that we are um, very much white and not a part of a minority experience. 
Mm-hmm. And so, um, and so your observation that Jews really do exist, whether you're a, a right-leaning Jew or a left-leaning Jew, you are a, in, in a lot of ways, have this feeling of being a political outsider to, to others who would be in your camp. Um, that feeling of being an outsider um, is very much a part of the Jewish experience. Um, yeah, and I'm, you know, and honestly, I'm grateful for it. I mean, both as, I'm grateful for it because maybe of the career I chose, or maybe it's that outside attitude that pushed me into the career that I chose. But I think when you, when one lives slightly outside of the mainstream, you are, you know, you, you pay, you pay more keen attention to it. Um, you know, if, you know, as a, as a kind of primitive survival mechanism, like you just sort of have to be aware of your surroundings. And I don't mean to exaggerate, like my experiences at all, like my experiences in this country have been fantastic overall. Um, but that feeling of slight, being a slight outsider, I, I, I think always remains. And that's true. I think for gay people, for Muslims, for whomever, you know, if you, if you, if you exist sort of just outside of that mainstream, you're, you're just going to pay more attention to your environment. Yeah, yeah, and and you're more aware of of the sea in which you're swimming, right? Because of a perceived or imagined threat, um, and also there there's this, you know, there's something that actually I was talking to uh, to someone who I'm working with towards conversion earlier today, um, who you know I said you know men wear keep you can't really see it it's black but you you know men could theoretically wear a keepote without um, it, and in reform circles, women can wear kippot too, obviously, but, you know, a Jewish man to self-identify as a Jew could wear a kippah. Um, she, in her journey, actually got a, uh, and, and this is not me advocating for it, but she got a tattoo on her on her wrist of a Jewish star, so that whenever she extended her arms out to anyone, they would be able to see her Jewishness, and so um, there is a, a, there is this um, uh, putting out your Judaism and expressing publicly your Judaism. Um, I guess a tattoo is different, but one of the things that um, that I found to be complicated is when things feel tense or when I feel like I'm in the wrong space or place, you just take this off and you're white, you know? And it's one of those things where if only they knew who you are, um, how would they see you differently? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, you know, it, it, it's an interesting conversation that you have, and, and we're not going to talk about Judaism this whole time, although maybe we will. I mean, this is a Jewish congregation, but um, one of the things that I was that I was struck by as I was reading through your book is, um, is what different cultures have to say about manhood. I mean, you spoke about manhood from, uh, from a secular American perspective. And so we'll talk about the Jewish piece in a moment, but um, I'm thinking about rites of passage here. You don't really write about rites of passage in your book, but um, can you describe maybe uh, in your own reflection some American rites of passage from boyhood to manhood, um, what those transitions are, what those look like, and maybe what they say about who we are as a society? Well, one of the things I do say in the book is that I, I sense that one of the things we really lack in the culture is a true rite of passage for men, Mm -hmm. boys becoming men. And we kind of, I think all sense that because we all understand and we all know the stereotype of the adult boy, you know, that boy who has never quite grown up. I use um, the example of Adam Sandler to say that like he's made a whole career out of this, you know, out of this, out of this idea, Um, this, you know, adolescence that never quite seems to go away. And, you know, the the bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah thing doesn't quite do it either. You know, nobody nobody leaves a bar mitzvah going, you know what, he's a man now. You know, there's like... (laughs) Um, I I want to... It, it is interesting. I know maybe we'll talk about the bar mitzvah, but um, th- there's there's a great movie. I don't know if you've seen it. I saw it years ago called Keeping Up with the Steins. Have no. you heard of this movie? There's a great movie. I'll just describe to you my favorite scene in this movie. It's it's a movie about a boy's bar mitzvah. And uh, anyway, the boy before his uh, before the morning of his bar mitzvah, he's you know he's this you know mildly overweight, you know, like really short little guy. And he's, he's, he's standing there with a towel wrapped around his waist, looking in his bathroom mirror, getting ready for his bar mitzvah. And he's giving himself a pump up talk. He says, today I become a man. Today I become a man. He beats today I become a man. And then he picks up his SpongeBob SquarePants toothbrush and brushes his teeth. <laughs> so there is, there, 
there, there, there, there's something about um, about the bar mitzvah, though. Um, uh, maybe, and, and maybe this isn't the right question to to ask, and and we can we can move on. Um, uh, that I want to return to is um, is based on your understanding of the bar mitzvah, right? Because it does function as a transitional moment, right? I mean, your shoulders don't get big, and you know you can't drink bourbon, but um, if your parents follow the rules. Um, but but what do you feel a bar mitzvah says about Jewish understandings of manhood? Well, look, I I did, I am coming at it from a very secular point of view. I was I myself was not bar mitzvah, uh, but my understanding of it is really it's a way of welcoming these sort of prospective members of the community into the community in a deeper way. It's, mm. not, it's not really saying, okay, now, you know, you lead the household and you're gonna lead the hunt. It's saying, you know- Our we, people don't hunt, right? <laughs> <laughs> we recognize you as a kind of new member of our community. And this is, and this is, this is the ritual that we go through at a certain point in our lives to bring ourselves into this community as, mm. as fuller members than just as children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like um, with your experience growing up as a Jew and as, and as a Jewish man, and also thinking about Jewish masculinity today, I mean, we have uh, 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 Doug Emhoff, who is now a very public Jewish man. Um, uh, there, there are some surprising trends. I, I'm, I'm going to share a couple with you, and then I want to hear, uh, hear some reactions. Um, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but over 5% of J-Date is not Jewish. Huh. But there, so you scroll through, and that's basically one in twenty people are not Jews, and that's you know, they, they say that as much in, in their JDA profiles. Um, there is uh, there was a study done in 2017 out of Pew Research, which is uh, a highly regarded research institution, um, that showed that Jews were the most um, widely admired and respected religious minority in the country, um, and um, and and. We here as a people, and you said this before, you know, being Jewish in America, this has been a very good experience. It's been a very positive experience. Um, one of my history professors said, and I'll say this here, that uh, that there's never been a better time, never been a better place to be Jewish than America today. Um, and um, and you even go back a generation or two, maybe two or three, and to marry a Jew really was in America was to marry down, uh, to limit your life options. Um, and here today, again, you have one in 20 jade eight profiles being people who are not Jewish. So um, that is a long way and a long lead up of, of asking, do you feel like, um, and, and this is not my way of being self-congratulatory at all, but do you feel like there's something different about a Jewish perception of manhood? Or are we just as guilty as the rest of everybody uh, in their misperceptions? It's hard for me to say, um... You know, I know, I'm just trying to think of like all the Jews that I've known, all the Jewish men that I've known. Um, I do think there is something inherent in Judaism about uh, contemplation, self-contemplation that maybe maybe is helpful in terms of how men in Judaism, how we think of ourselves. But I don't think that's, you know, I think that's there. I don't, I think it's a component of being an yeah. American Jew. I don't think it, I don't think it's, there, there, there's plenty of idiot Jews, you know, and plenty of guys, Jewish guys who are out there doing the wrong thing. And, and absolutely. And, you know, are, are, are certainly, no better or worse than anybody else in the culture. But I do think in, in very general terms, Jewish guys might be slightly more open to messages of, of, of self-reflection and contemplation. At least that's, that's a stereotype, right? If we're just talking, if we're talking stereotypes here, right? There is a certain stereotype that I've heard at least, right? Where, uh, you know, you meet a nice Jewish boy Mm -hmm. Right, and and there's there are understandings of that um, that are that that carry a lot of a lot of meaning and connotation beyond just the fact that someone was born a Jew. But there's um, also something I think um, passively aggressive, feminizing yes. about the idea of the nice Jewish boy. Yes, there, 
because, because along with that sort of self-reflection element of it is the um, slightly weak stereotype of Jews. Right. Um, and I think those things go hand in hand because in Western culture, we tend to associate intellectualism with a kind of feyness, a kind of femininity. Yeah. Uh, and in, you know, in America in particular, if you're, if you're somebody who's bookish, you're sort of assumed to be weak. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's something that I think a lot of Jewish guys probably feel kind of self-conscious about that they want to project. No, I'm just a dude, you know? And so, you know, we put on our Knicks jerseys and we make a lot of noise and, you know, yeah. We, and next thing you know, you have that movie uncut gems, which I love by the way. I've, I've actually never seen it. It's on my short list. Oh, it's really good. It's on my short list. Um, you know, you, 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 you talk about, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if you use this term in the book, but you talk in a way about hyper-masculinity and the different ways that men um, signal masculinity to each other. I, I want to I just read, read a passage uh, from this book. Um, uh, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, you write that the language of traditional masculinity, and we talked about this before, is an endless series of smoke signals we send up warning the enemy we're not to be trifled with. Here is a man we say, in the way we drink our coffee, not the more feminine tea. Here is a man uh, with the pickup truck we drive, the clothes we wear, the curt way we nod to each other in the elevator. It's every niggling, exhausting detail of our lives informing all who dare to gaze upon us that we are men, not because we are strong, but because we are scared others will think we are weak. Um, what does the signaling of masculinity, when you think about these hyper-masculine men who are uh, all the more present now than ever before, what do you feel like that says about how they understand themselves? I think more than anything, it says I'm afraid. I really do. I mean, I think I, I think I say this in the book, maybe not in these words, but the default setting for contemporary masculinity or the way we kind of understand in stereotypical ways what masculinity means. I think the default setting for that, what's underneath all that is terror. I really do. I think so much, and, and the terror is about, um, there's physical terror. There's like, you know, I'm afraid somebody's gonna hurt me. Yeah. There's also the terror or the fear of not being able to provide and protect, which is how we traditionally see our roles in the culture, how we, how, how we traditionally derive value for ourselves as men. And so the more you project, I'm strong, I'm rich, I'm powerful, like whatever it is, to me, that always just says, I'm scared. Yeah. Like I'm scared you won't think I'm these things. I'm scared you won't think that I have a kind of inherent worth as a man or as a human. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's this, there's this almost like a lack of intrinsic or whatever the word is, but, but internally generated self-worth that is made up for by these external validations. You have this great term, I wrote it down, the, the fluttering prestige of the meaningless. Mm. Oh, it's great, it's great. Um, you know, if these, if these metrics are, and, and, and you're right, when you think about the, 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 the bigger cars you drive, the, the kind of job that you have, the, your, your affect in, in large groups, these kinds of, of external metrics of, of internal deficiencies or internal uh, fears. I told you my kids would interrupt, right? Yeah. Um, uh, are, are, there, are there healthier measures for you for what masculinity could be? Yeah. Um, and they're the same measures that I think we, you know, what's funny about this book is that I'm not saying anything new here. You know, I, I'm, I'm not smart enough to break any new ground on any of this. But what I think I'm doing fairly well is synthesizing things that we already know and making them a little bit more digestible. So the things that I think make people better men are the same things that make us just better humans. You know, there's no, and we already know what those things are. Like all of us know how to conduct our lives in responsible ways. 
We know that we need to be empathetic. We know that we need to be nurturers and we know that we need to support. We know that we need to, at times, protect and provide, of course. We know kind of all the things that we should be doing um, and all the things that make us feel whole, um, both as men and just as humans. But we have a hard time living it for innumerable reasons. And I'm just outlining some of those reasons here. And some, and you know, some of those reasons are really specific to men. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, it's interesting. Um, do you feel like, I mean, you're writing from your and own- I just want to interrupt my, I'm interrupted just for a second to say, like, I'm as guilty of this as anybody, you know? Oh. Like I'm as much of a mess in this respect as anybody else out there. Like the title of the book, A Better Man, you know, it's written as a letter to my son, but more than anything, it's a letter to, I mean, as much as anything, it's a letter to me going, hey, dude, like you need to be better. And, you know, you need to remind yourself. So when I, you know, I, I can make these grand pronouncements, but I'm as guilty as anybody of not living up to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. And I, I've, I've wondered this again ever since middle school. Um, it sounds uh, like middle school was tough for you. It was hard. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was. It was. You know, it's good. It's better now. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, uh, you know, m m what I wonder is, are are most men aware of these human drives that make someone good, or these these human impulses that make someone good? Um, are these things that 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 they intrinsically crave, or are they um, you know, I, I'm just thinking about some of the, some of the people who who didn't uh, who didn't turn out all that well, uh, who struggled in, in later chapters of their lives, and and it felt like some of the things that you're talking about, like like empathy, like love, like uh, like sacrifice, which I want to talk about at a later point in this conversation, um, maybe didn't come all that easily to them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I don't know, I was thinking about this book as, as, you know, there are so many people who I would love to, to throw this copy at them, lock them in a room and open the door in a, in a day or two or a week or two, depending on their reading level. And, uh, and I don't know if those people are reading these books or this particular book. Um, no, I don't think they are. Yeah. Um, I want to, um, uh, I'm not going to get in trouble, but I'm going to let you get in trouble. Um, uh, you, you write about, and, and, and beautifully, about um, masculinity and um, and in a lot of ways the uh, the political climate that we're in and it feels like your most of the, even though we're in uh, who knows if we're in a different political climate now but it feels like uh, not only was this book because your son was going to college but because you were looking around you and seeing men do things that you wish men wouldn't um, and so could you talk about the political climate in which you're writing this book and how that if that was a, a part of that generative process of getting this to publish. Yeah, and it, I think it would have been impossible for it not to be because what I saw as I was writing this was this hyper-masculinity that you were talking about running the country, this idea of showy masculinity, really performative masculinity. Um, cartoonish masculinity in my estimation. That's a great cartoonish masculinity, that's perfect. Um, and that person was the head of our government. And there has to be something very attractive about that for some people for that to come to pass. And, you know, I have some sympathy for that. I understand what it's like to look at the guy with the nicest car in your high school and go, God, I wish that was me. Yeah. You know, the guy who lives in the biggest house and go, God, I wish that was me. The guy who has the hottest girlfriend and you go, I wish that was me. Like, I understand those impulses pretty deeply. And I understand that feeling of looking around your life as a, as a boy or as a young man and going, I don't see how this is gonna get better. And here's this duration of masculinity that seems to quote unquote have it all. And 
maybe there's something there. Maybe there's, maybe, maybe, maybe that's something I can follow. And in doing so, it can validate all these ideas that I've been taught about masculinity that maybe haven't been working for me exactly, but I can look over there and go, oh, but it can, it can work. Yeah. It, if I just go that way, it means I don't have to look too deeply at myself because it validates everything I've been sort of taught, rightly or wrongly, in my opinion, wrongly. And so I don't need to do a course correction. If anything, I can double down. I can put my foot on the speed on the gas pedal and go, yeah, baby, let's go. Let's follow that guy. Yeah. And what ends up happening, I think, is what ended up happening, which is so much of um, the culture in any environment, you know, a work environment, a, a national environment, a family environment flows from the top. So if you have somebody at the top who's saying, you know, I'm not going to take a, a good hard look at what I'm doing or what we're doing as a country, um, and I'm not going to admit error, and I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to deny inconvenient facts. Eventually, as you know, people were saying for the last four years, reality has a way of intruding on that, and it has. Um, and, you know, in my opinion, uh, we're, we're paying a pretty steep price for what I think is, um, although I don't like the term, like the perfect example of toxic masculinity. Yeah. 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 So you're not going to get in trouble. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to get in trouble for saying Terrific. That. Great. It was came from Michael, <laughs> not from me. Um, uh, you know, it's one of the things that you wrote in the book, and, and I think is 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 such a, um, a a deep insight into the political climate that we're in, is that, um, and I never thought about this before, but that masculinity is something you earn or achieve, and and womanhood, which we haven't talked about today, uh, tonight, is something that you become, right? It's something that you're that you grow into. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. That's, that's, uh, I, I, when we're talking about rites of passage, that's yeah. what I, I, where I was heading is that men don't have in this culture, like a real rite of passage where you, you know, you do a walkabout and you come back and you're like, okay, I've seen it. Like I've been out in the desert and I survived. And now I can kind of call myself a man. Whereas with girls, it's nobody ever says to a girl, the way they, you know, you'll say to a boy, be a man. Nobody ever says to a girl, be a woman. Yeah. Because I, th and I, I think it's because we understand that girls will become women in a way that we don't understand boys will become men. And it's a product of biology. It's, I, I'm not saying it's correct the way we think about it, but I think it's because women start menstruating. I mean, girls start menstruating. And at that point, we sort of believe that they have entered the realm of womanhood. It's kind of anachron, it's definitely anachronistic because it's placing um, the ultimate value of a woman on her ability to become a mother. We have never quite had that same thing for boys um, for obvious reasons. I mean, boys can't get pregnant. Um, but we have never, in this culture, I don't think, quite equated fatherhood with masculinity in the same way that we've equated motherhood with femininity. Um, our value as men has not been traditionally dependent on our ability to raise children in the same way that it has value of women has been for, uh, has been their ability to raise children. Which is so interesting because I remember you writing in your book, and this is also my own personal experience. You know, I have two, I have two young girls. Um, uh, I never saw myself as a man in quite as powerful a way as when I had children, right? And 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 for you, and and for me, and and maybe for others who who are blessed to be parents, um, there is something, um, there is something 
um, that changes your understanding of who you are as a man when, when you are now raising an, another child. Um, uh, you know, and, and on that note, you, you, you talk about, oh, I should also say in a couple of minutes, we're gonna open up the, the floor. I have all kinds of questions. I could keep going for another you know, hour or two, but um, we're gonna open up the floor for other questions that might come from our congregation. So if you have uh, questions, you are free to um, unmute yourself and ask or just put them in the chat um, in, in just a few moments, but you can start doing that now if you like. Um, you, you, we can think about all of the different um, signaling on the infinite access of manhood that uh, that men give and, and receive from one another. Um, but a lot of your book is about love, and I'm wondering if you can talk about the connection between um, manhood and what, by any kind of stereotype in America today, its opposite love would be. What's that connection for you between manhood and love? I had to. In order to point a direction towards where I was hoping, you know, my son will end up and where I'm hoping I will end up, I, I, I feel like I had to understand kind of first what masculinity is in, in sort of the traditional context mm -hmm. and then think about where I wanted it to go. And one of the, one of, the same way I didn't want to write about race, <laughs> I didn't want to write about love because it felt so kind of sappy and maybe saccharine and gooey. And did it feel not manly to you? Well, that was my own sort of conditioning going, yeah. come on, don't be, you know, don't be like, that. <laughs> you know, don't, don't be <laughs> such a wimp and write about love. But what I realized in writing about this. And, uh, and, and, and some of it just came from research and reading about love and reading about happiness and trying to reframe the way I thought men should think about themselves. What I recognized eventually is that it takes tremendous strength, not only to love, but to be loved. Yeah. That you have to allow yourself to become unguarded in order to give and even I think in for a lot of guys in a more difficult way receive love so if you think about men sort of walking around like this saying don't mess with me you know I'm a man yeah the boxer who does that is protected yeah. the boxer who lets his guard down is basically saying take your best shot I'm here you know and I can take it I can I can do that so opening yourself up to love means almost definitionally opening yourself to uh, hurt and pain as well. Like you, there's both of those things have to happen for you to freely give and receive love. And so that means necessarily that you have to admit that you're vulnerable. You have to admit that, that your strength isn't all consuming. You have to be able to, you know, let your guard down and when I started thinking about reframing masculinity and love and as, as an act of strength, as an act of power, that kind of clicked for me in a way that it, it hadn't before. So, you know, those, those, that idea of love being a wimpy thing yeah. went out the window. Yeah. And I realized that it's in fact kind of the most powerful act you can perform. Yeah. You know, and, and, and when you're talking about love as... Um, as um, as a source of pain, right? I mean, it, it's it's uh, it, you had this great. Uh, I, I, I watched all the Star Wars Star Wars movies since since COVID started. Um, it makes a great like workout video. Um, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you, you talk about Luke Skywalker, right? Where he's about to be frozen by by Thanks. Darth Vader. Answer. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes. Yeah, see, I've only watched them once. I should watch them many more times. Forgive me for I have sinned. Um, no, then the call is over. I mean, thanks, but this. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, so so yeah. So tell tell us about that scene and 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 what that shows us about about this uh, about masculinity's strange relationship with love. So there's a great scene in The Empire Strikes Back where Han Solo, who's this roguish anti-hero. Um, and is, you know, kind of who we think of when we think of sort of, you know, classically male types. Um, he's very guarded. 
he's very distant emotionally, but he and uh, Princess Leia, you know, there's definitely sparks there, but they haven't quite admitted it to each other. So Han is about to be essentially executed, frozen in what they call carbonite. His life is over. He's going to spend eternity frozen in this block of ice. Um, and right before it happens, Princess Leia finally goes, I love you. And instead of saying, <laughs> I love you too, in this moment of ultimate peril for himself, he's unable to let his guard down enough to say it. Instead, he says, I know. Mm. And, mm. you know, it's a kind of, it's a kind of funny moment. It's a kind of touching moment. And it's also a really telling and revealing moment about not only that character, but a way, the way a lot of guys, you can go to your grave unable to release that last part of yourself to fully inhabit your own emotional space. Um, it's, it's a tragic moment, I think. It's funny, but it's tragic. You know, if it, if it was, a, if it was, somebody on their deathbed, you know, can you imagine how mad you imagine. Be at that person who they're just being cocky in their last <laughs> moment? And you're like, wait a minute. Like, I just gave you everything that I can. And you just went like, you know? Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Well, you know, and, and when you talk about, when you talk about love, um, as whether as a father or as a spouse or as, 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 a, as, a, as a close relative or friend, um, the more you admit to love, the more you admit that the world can hurt you. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah, and we have this idea that, that men cannot be hurt by the world and, and we would rather not be loved than be hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we walk, you know, there's this, you know, you walk around with, with your boxer gloves on for anyone who's trying to come close. Um, uh, so, um, so look, I, I want to, um, um, I have many more questions, um, and and there are, there's a lot that I that I want to unpack with you. I also want to make sure that uh, the people who've joined us uh, have a chance to to talk with you and to ask you their questions about uh, manhood, uh, gender, love, connection. I, I want to if you have questions about grace or humility, that's where I'm going next. But um, but are there are there questions from uh, from our congregation uh, that you'd like to ask Michael at this time? Yeah, Andrew, please. And if you, you, can, you can raise your hand here, I, can, I, I can't see everybody's hand. You can also, if you know how to use the hand raising function in Zoom, that might be a, a, a good way to go as well. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself. Andrew, please. I just wanna say thank you, uh, Michael, for talking with us tonight. And I'm so happy you guys brought up that Star Wars reference because I was like a couple minutes prior, I was like, oh, wait, hold on, they're, they're describing the Star Wars scene. And that was so true because they changed that line because it wasn't manly. Or a character like Han Solo to say, I love you too. Mm. Is that what he said in the original script? I think I remember from the documentary, uh, it just, they, they, they said that that was the original scripted line. I love you, or I love you too. And wait, hold on. That doesn't sound like a Han Solo, a, a mucho, you know, uh, kind of like man, man's man. He has to, he, ha he can't sound gushy, wooshy, like lovey, dovey, you know, that doesn't. And I, I think that's so wrong. And, and here's like sort of my, my question about, it. I, I call this, caveman mentality, this, this, this toxic masculinity, we don't really, as a culture, as a society, um, endorse or, or, or convey to men, it's okay to be in touch with not just the feelings of others, but your own feelings as well. And it's not weak as a man to show that, you know, display your character, like what good did you do at work this week? Did you save a, a, a tenant from being evicted? Did you, you know, as a doctor, did you, you know, save a patient's life? Or did you save someone, you know, as a, some money as an account? I, I don't know, like, but something, Worth you know explain like this shows the, the integrity of your mind and your honor and your and and I'm guilty of it somewhat myself but it's always very difficult to somewhat convey this this narrative in a culture that's dominated by this caveman mentality. Yeah, it is, um, and I think every guy knows what you're talking about. And I think you know what's funny is like you know there's that locker room thing that guys have. And I would bet you, like, if you could he feel or hear their interior lives going on as they're having that conversation, they probably all feel like you do, you know, like, ah, oh, geez, like, I, 
I don't want to have to compete like about who's getting laid more right. or this or that. Like, I wish I could escape that, but they worry that everybody else in that circle is so enthralled with it that they're going to be judged and diminished in the eyes of others. Um, and you know, like I'm guilty of it too. Like we all like have those things. We all have those sort of male bonding things that can be fun and challenging and, and, you know, it's fun to rib other guys and it, and, you know, comedians, um, the way so many comedians tell each other they love them is to make fun of them. And, you know, guys in a lot of ways are, are similar. I think the challenge for guys, I don't like, and I don't think we need to get rid of that. Like, that's fine. But I think we need to be able to also move beyond it at times, take yeah. the next step at times and feel like that's okay. And you're not going to be diminished. If anything, like the fact that you can have a conversation with your bro about something real, something that's troubling you, something that's vulnerable, or you're able to listen with empathy to his problems, um, you know, that should be an elevating thing. And, and, and it, and what's funny is like, we don't think twice about women doing this. We understand that women do this and their French, so much of the, the connectivity of their friendships is based on this, but we don't give ourselves the same permission, partially because we think it's feminine to do it. And it's absurd. It's human to want to have those connections. Mm -hmm. It's human to want to socialize and share. And incidentally, like, I think the line in Empire Strikes Back is kind of brilliant. Like, I think it's it's because it's so true to character, but it illustrates something so tragic about being a guy. Yeah. Well, it came out in the early uh, Reagan years, so I think we know why. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Interesting. Um, I see, uh, Ben, you have your hand up. We have uh, just a few more moments, um, and then I want to ask a closing question. I'll, I'll do really quick. I, Michael, you were saying, um, earlier um and i just wanted to ask you um you said that you know i think you were saying jewish men are open to are more open to self-reflection and i was just curious on why um like what you what the connection is what you think um that is that's something that i actually as a, a you know a jewish man think about a lot and and so i'm just curious on what what, what why do you think that is I'm sure uh, Aaron Rabbi Miller could 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 talk about this in much greater depth than I can but I do think the history of Judaism, the, the way we em emerged as a, as a cohesive people, um, so much of it was about questioning and continues to be about questioning. I just think it's so deeply etched into our DNA that um, I think the Christian traditions don't have as much. I could be totally wrong about that, but I think Judaism is so, you know, is, is, is so um, literate in a way, you know, it's so wrapped up in the word, um, the written word and, and questioning and, and tumbling those words over in your mind and having the authority as an individual in that religion to question it. Um, obviously every religion, you know, examines their, their words carefully, every, you know, their holy text carefully. But I think Judaism um, encourages its members, it's, you know, it's, it's just regular members to do that in a way that maybe other religions don't. And I, I, I think that is the kind of foundational DNA that I'm talking about. Um, and I could be wrong. Um, I mean, look, it, it's for another time, I think it's a, it's a fascinating conversation to have. It strikes me just from a, from a 50,000 foot view into secular masculinity that there is, there is something emasculating, right? A feminizing about asking a question about not knowing an answer. Um, and there is also separately in the in a um, in a traditional way of understanding Jewish masculinity something incredibly powerful and and, um, and masculine about asking a great question um, for, for for another time. But uh, but thank you, Ben, for that. Um, uh, Michael, the, the last question I have for you tonight um, is about love. I know this is not what you wanted to write about, um, and it sounds like a lot of the book was you weren't planning on writing about, but got wrapped up in this, any of this book. I mean, which is incredible, which is incredible. Um, uh, and I wish we had more time to talk about how your son reacted to this. You know, if you have a version for your daughter that you, your wife plans on writing, we're not gonna get there tonight. But what, what I do wanna share is this, you know, what, what's so clear from this book 
um, is that your life in this chapter, wasn't before, but your life in this chapter is so wrapped up in, defined by the love you share for others and the love they have for you. And um, to, to finish our conversation on masculinity, Michael, um, how, how does love make you as a man stronger? When I let it, when I'm able to recognize the love in my life, which is considerable, yeah. um, it gives me a, uh, a grounding and a platform. Um, the word I use in the book is uh, groundedness, a feeling of being at home in the world. I often you know, think about my life now in terms of my geographic space, this home that I live in and the family that lives within it and feeling like I know where I am in a geographic sense, but the groundedness that I'm talking about goes much deeper than that. It is the groundedness of having lived a life and having uh, given and received love and knowing that I have value in the world, um, not because of the library letter, that I have, which is a very nice library letter, but is a result of whatever good I have done in terms of um, my relationships, the love that I have given, you know, to my close circle of, of people, my, in, my close circle of intimates, and then hopefully to, to the larger world as well. I think when you don't have that, when you don't have that love in your life, um, and I don't necessarily, and I don't mean that, that that love doesn't mean a, a spouse or a partner or even a, or a child or friends. I think it means, um, a, 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 a sense of being a positive force in the world, however small, I think that is the same thing as saying, love, but I think it gives you a groundedness that transcends physical space or time. I, you know, I think it transcends age. I think it is, um, it, 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 it is your ultimate power, I think. Mm. And that gets I, into metaphysical. Now we're getting spiritual. No, and, 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 there, and, and your book is in, in, in so many ways, um, a, a more spiritual understanding of what it means to be a man today. And as you said, what it means to be a person today, you know, so much of what you write about is men struggle with maybe in, in more intense ways, but, um, but it, it, is a, it is a guide to being a strong, grounded, loving, gracious, humble person. Um, and uh, in, in, in a time and place when, when other things may be valued, at least externally much higher. Um, and so I want to thank you for writing this a terrific book uh, for the, uh, on, on your son's behalf, right? For this gift that you have given him. Um, this is what I tell my bar mitzvah parents before they bless their children, before they read Torah, that their children are not going to pay a bit of attention to what they wrote in that particular moment. But I promise them, and I, I'm sure for you too, that, uh, that those children, before, they're, before they get married, before their children have their own bar and bat mitzvahs, uh, those children are going to hold on to what their, their parents wrote to them and treasure it for the rest of their lives. Um, and so your son is still a teenager, early, early non-teenager. Um, but this book, as much as we've been gifted uh, by, by what you have written, um, I know that your son and daughter by extension are going to be the, the greatest recipients of this gift that you have given in this real act of love. Um, so I wanna thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our congregational community tonight. This has been a joy. And um, chazak, chazak, my friend, from strength to strength, may you be strengthened. Um, thank you all for joining us, uh, for our Washington Hebrew family for being here. And uh, Michael Ian Black, thank you so much uh, for being a part of this. And, um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk again soon. Well, thank you, Rabbi. And thank you, everybody at Washington Hebrew for hosting me today. It was a real pleasure. And thanks for the great questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.